So I want to thank you for being part of this particular day. Uh, if you don't live in the Chicagoland area, you may not be aware that we are under a winter storm warning that's supposed to hit Saturday night into Sunday morning. And so rather than uh, tempt to God uh, in terms of safety, we felt it would be better to tape the message ahead of time. So I'm very thankful to Pastor Kevin. Uh, as we're here, it's Saturday afternoon, it's 1.20. Uh, snow is on the way, we know that. But we trust that God's Word, which is alive and living and speaks no matter what time it is, uh, I hope that as you hear this message, that God will speak to your heart. Uh, let me pray for us, and then we'll begin to look to God's Word together. Father, we come to you and we thank you in Jesus' name that our lives are uh, totally in your hands. Uh, we think about this storm that's coming. Uh, we had a storm this week that missed Sunday altogether. Uh, and now this one, for whatever reason, it appears that uh, us and many others will need to cancel services, but I'm thankful that your word can still go forth. I thank you for those who are listening. Uh, I pray that you would speak to their hearts, uh, and that, Father, that again, as we know, your word will not return void. Father, we pray for our country. Uh, we do so all the time. Our prayer being uh, that you would uh, work through those who are the leaders in the country, uh, that, Father, you would touch their hearts, and even if not to them, uh, that, Father, you would speak to your people, that, that, Lord, you would remind us that we are part of an eternal family. Uh, this connection being made now uh, through the airwaves reminds us, that even though we cannot be together physically, still we are bound together because of our relationship to Jesus Christ. And so we pray for the country, we pray for us, that we ask, Lord, that you would work in order that you would be exalted. And now just for a moment, before we look to God's word together, uh, would you pray silently in your heart to the Lord and say, Lord, speak to me this day through your word. Lord, speak to us. Our desire is to see Jesus. I pray for the one who's here today. You know my sins, and I ask for forgiveness. And I pray now that the Holy Spirit of God, through the Word of God, would exalt Jesus Christ alone. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen. So the story is told about a business meeting at a kind of a small southern church. And one of the deacons said, Pastor, I think we need a chandelier for the church. And no reply to another deacon, I'm against it. And uh, the first deacon said, why don't you think we need a chandelier? And the second deacon said, well, first, nobody in the church can spell it. Second, nobody in the church can play it. And third, what this church needs above all else is more light. Well, I, I think you get it. Uh, the idea of chandelier is a light, but at times we can get confused that when we don't understand uh, what we're talking about. And I think about our culture right now. Uh, we're living in a day with a pandemic. Uh, we're living in a day where, where changes in the country, where uh, moral fiber is being challenged on so many different fronts. And, and for those who are Christians, for God's children, it's easy at times, uh, kind of like with this winter storm coming, uh, that, that our visibility is kind of clouded. We get a little blurry. And we need to remind ourselves uh, that this is not our home. That our home, our citizenship, in fact, as Paul says, is in heaven. And because of that, we have a different viewpoint as to what we see around us. Because we know that we rest in the hands of the Lord. And he holds us secure in spite of what we see. And so this morning, as we look to God's word, as we've been doing a series uh, from Hebrews chapter 11, to which I would invite you to turn, we're talking about trusting God in spite of what we see. So even when things seem cloudy, uh, we still trust him no matter what. Hebrews chapter 11. And this morning, uh, I want to talk about going wherever God leads. And we're going to talk about Abraham. And as you're uh, turning to the scriptures, if you haven't already, if you'll find the outline. And the nice thing about doing this uh, online is that you can pause and you can find the outline and follow along with where we're going. Uh, we're reminded each week that Hebrews 11 is referred to as a faith hall of fame. Uh, people after per people uh, listed trusted God in spite of of what they saw. And the definition of faith that, that we've been talking about, it comes from uh, Dr. Warren Wearsby, and it is having consistent obedience in God's word in spite of the consequences or circumstances. Consistent obedience to God's word in spite of the circumstances and consequences. And in the case of Abraham, he had no idea where God was sending him. However, he trusted God 
and he went. And in his obedience, he showed his faith in the Lord. Hebrews chapter 11. And if you would, look at verse 8. This is by faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed, by going out to the place uh, which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien, in a land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Well, you think about going wherever God leads, and, and as you look at the outline, point number one is this. It requires instant obedience. It requires instant obedience. Again, the beginning of verse 8. It is by faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed. In those particular words, the way that they're shaped, it's a grammatical tool within the Greek language uh, to talk about the following idea. Uh, it's that when he was called, he obeyed. And the words when called or in the Greek tense, it indicates a very swift response. And as one writer put it, uh, he obeyed the call while, while it was still sounding in his ears. He obeyed the call while it was still sounding in his ears. It's almost like uh, somebody says to you, your spouse may say to you, I need to go to you to go to the store and get, and, and even before they finish that sentence, you're already up getting your keys. Uh, you're already in that act of obedience, even though you don't know how the sentence is going to end. When Abraham was called, he obeyed. He did right away what God had asked him to do. He didn't question. He didn't need more details, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, he just obeyed. And, and right away, I thought about Joseph, the, the father of Jesus. Several times he was warned in a dream that this is what you need to do. And each time he obeyed. Now understand, God will let us question. Uh, we see this throughout Scripture uh, in many cases. Gideon, uh, you may recall, he, he put out a couple fleeces to God. He said, I just want to be sure. Uh, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, uh, he asked, how can this be? Well, it ended up in his case, he couldn't speak for several months, but he, he still was allowed to question. Uh, the psalmist, over and over again, they, they, they question, we're allowed to. But once we understand that this is what God wants for us, this is what God wants you to do, then we need to obey. We need to do that which God has told us to do. Uh, there was a church with a reputation for being very hard on janitors. And uh, janitor after janitor was, was let go. And let me read you the story. After one old man had been there for several years, someone asked him, quote, how in the world do you manage to get along in this church with so many contrary orders and instructions? And the janitor with great wisdom said, I just put my mind in neutral and let them push me around. Well, I thought about that, and it doesn't parallel exactly with God, obviously, as you know, because he doesn't give us contrary information. He doesn't push us around. But when you're a follower of Christ, uh, the idea is that we have transformed minds. And, and our minds then are, are able to be, to be moved, to be shaped, uh, to be taken wherever it is that God wants us to go. And, and that's a desire of God for us, as it was for Abraham. Uh, when God calls us, are we willing to go? And when we know that it's God who's leading us, will we obey right away? Here's the second thing uh, in relation to going wherever God leads us. It requires instant obedience. Second, it, it means obeying without knowing. Obeying without knowing. Again, look at Hebrews 11 uh, in verse 8. It's by faith Abraham, when he was called, he obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. Again, he's going to receive that, but notice, and he went out not knowing where he was going. So in other words, God says, I have good news and bad news. You're going to uh, receive this land someday as an inheritance. However, I'm not going to tell you where it is. And, and so the idea for Abraham, uh, he went out doing that which God told him to do, even though he didn't know where it was God was directing him. I want you to keep your finger, if you would, in Hebrews chapter 11 and, and turn back to Genesis chapter 12. The one advantage we have in terms of these particular accounts is that they have commentary provided for us in the Older Testament. For Abraham, his story really begins in chapter 11, but where we want to begin uh, looking in relation to what we're talking about today, I want you to look back, if you would, to chapter 12. Abraham is called to start a new nation. In so doing, uh, he's called to leave where he is in order to follow the leading of God. And so it is that in chapter 12, 1 to 3, if you look at the pronoun I, you see it over and over again. Uh, as in God, I will bless you. I will make you a great nation. I will. This is what God is going to do. But for the purposes of what we will discuss, look if you would at verse 1. 
Again, Genesis 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will give you. So this is God's call on Abraham. Uh, Verses 4 to 6 recount the journey as Abraham heads out. But now look, if you would, at verse 7. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants I will give this land. And so he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And now we continue further, chapter 13. Look, if you would, at verse 15. The Lord says to Abraham, For all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your descendants forever. So Abraham's included in this promise. Uh, For most of us, uh, and I'm one of those people, we want to know where we're going. Uh, We want to know what's going to happen. There are those who, uh, when they go on vacation, they don't really make a lot of plans. They just want to go. But for most of us, we want to have some idea uh, of where it is we're going to go. And the question is from God is when he asks us to do something, will we do it in spite of knowing all the details? Uh, Will we do it, will we obey uh, instantaneously, quickly, right away, even though we may not know all the details included in God's plan? Abraham went out not knowing where he was going, but he went out to the land promised to him and to his descendants. Um, The following story is just one of those funny stories from my family lore. And it just, I had to to set it up this way. Uh, When we were in Fort Myers, pastoring a church, uh, we met a couple. Uh, He was an an executive with a billion dollar company. Uh, The company sent him to Europe uh, to be able to take over their European branch. And so we had the privilege of going over to England, of staying with them, and of uh, actually going on a weekend uh, trip with them. Uh, He was one of those people who, in his business, uh, was very detailed. Again, you're talking about a billion dollar company. He's helping to manage this company. uh, Very detailed, very organized. But when he got out uh, on trips, he loved to get lost. It it was just part of the way he was. And so it was uh, that we found ourselves going through a cornfield in France and we're lost. And his son, who was uh, just a a right at preteen, was kind of like, Dad, can we stop getting lost? And his father said, yeah, but if we hadn't gotten lost, we wouldn't see this, this cool church over here. And sure enough, there was this, this beautiful church. There were things that we otherwise would not have seen. But the idea with God is God takes us out. He doesn't give us all the details. But when we rest in his hands, we know, don't we, what? That we're never lost. We're never lost. It may seem that way. Uh, there are a lot of times when I feel that way. But we know that we're never lost because God is the one who is directing us. And so we rest on him. Uh, We obey uh, when he tells us to go. Uh, We obey even without knowing what it is he wants for us to do. But notice the third thought from the outline, and it's this. Going wherever God leads, uh, it involves sacrificing now. It involves sacrificing now. Look if you would at verse 9 back at Hebrews chapter 11. It is by faith he, Abram, uh, lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. Now, think about it just for a minute. Uh, Didn't God tell Abraham that he would possess the land in in which he was going? Uh, In fact, didn't God make these same promises as it related to Isaac and Jacob, his son and his grandson? God told him, I'm going to give you this land. But the paradox then is that Abraham got to the land promised by God, and he lived in it, but not as a resident. He was an alien. He was an alien in the very land that he was going to possess. In fact, as you you go back through Scripture, you know the only uh, portion of Canaan that he actually owned was the place where he he, uh, bought the grave in which he buried his wife. So think about it. He's told uh, that this land belongs to him and his descendants forever, yet he lived as an alien in the very land promised to him. Uh, It's a very interesting commentary uh, that comes on this particular passage. And in part of why it's so interesting, uh, it's found in Acts chapter 7. And in Acts 7, if you know your Bibles, you'll know that this is the account of Stephen. Stephen was one of those chosen to wait on tables in Acts chapter 6. They were the precursors of what we would call deacons, uh, servants of God. And and as you see from from Stephen, as you see from Philip, uh, these were men who didn't just wait on tables. They were godly people. Uh, They were servants of the Lord. Stephen was chosen because he was a man who honored God. 
Well, he had been accused of some things. He stands up to give a sermon, and it's in chapter 7, verses 2 to 6, that I want you to note what he says about Abraham. Again, Acts chapter 7, begin with verse 2. Stephen says, and he said, Hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. And he said to him, Depart from your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. And then he departed from the land of the Chaldeans and he settled in Haran. And from there, after his father died, God removed him into this country in which you are now living. Now look at verse 5. Notice. And he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground. Once again, he had that one little burial spot, but, but in terms of anything else, he didn't have anything. And yet even when he had no child, he, God, promised that he, God, would give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him. But God spoke uh, to this effect that his offspring would be aliens in a foreign land, that they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. So you think about it. Abraham followed God's leading and he received nothing but a promise on earth. He received nothing but a promise on earth. He didn't build a city. Uh, he didn't inhabit a permanent place. In fact, his home was his tent. And his tent moved wherever it is God wanted him to go throughout the years of his life on earth. Well, you think about it. Uh, for those who are Christ followers, you get the parallel, don't you? Uh, from Scripture, we are told that we are aliens. In other words, uh, the earth is not our final home. Paul, to the Philippians, says our citizenship is in heaven. And we get so trapped into wanting to hold on to the stuff that we have, all the while knowing that we don't take it with us. And following Jesus means a willingness to sacrifice for his kingdom and for his glory. So, so here's the reminder. We are stewards of what God gives to us. We are stewards of all people on earth. We understand this, that what we have comes from God, and it comes because of his grace. I don't deserve what I have, neither do you. But what I have, God's given to me. And God says to you and me, will you take what I've given to you and will you be stewards of it until you're finally home? And so you think about it. Uh, whether it's my rights or my resources, whether it's my time or my talents, whether it's my possessions or my privileges, the question is, are we willing to sacrifice to God uh, whenever he wants back that which he has given to us? For Abraham, he said, uh, I'm going to give you this land. However, you're not going to own it. Not really. Uh, you're not going to have possession of it. Not really. You're not going to build a city here. Uh, you're never going to settle in one place. But this is your land. And for you and me, uh, we live here right now. God has given us uh, where we are in our homes and our places. And right now, this is where we live. However, we understand that we are aliens waiting for that final day when God calls us home. But until then, my, my prayer, my exhortation, my reminder to us is that God allows us to be ambassadors for him while we live on this earth. Do we represent him? And as we represent him, I pray then uh, that those who are around us will be blessed by the grace that God has given to us. I told a story before uh, that a man had a, a Cadillac. He was one of those very, very wealthy men. And he decided he wanted to be buried in his Cadillac. So sure enough, uh, you know how it is with funeral homes, they'll do pretty much whatever given the right amount of money. Uh, and I'm not d disparaging him, please understand me. But you know, the idea is that uh, the man had money, he wanted to be buried in his Cadillac, so sure enough. So it's in a cemetery, they're lowering his Cadillac, and, and a couple of men are driving by, and one of them said, Wow, I thought they said you couldn't take it with you. Uh, you think about it, I mean, being buried in your Cadillac, I, I guess, but he really didn't take it with him, did he? Uh, however, as Christ followers, we understand this principle, that God has, has given us what we have in order that as we sacrifice, as we invest in him, it will never be taken away. We have an inheritance in heaven, reserved. Uh, nothing will destroy it. And, and so each day God says, will you walk in consistent obedience to my word in spite of the consequences of and the circumstances. Uh, wherever that takes us, whatever that means, will you and I do that which God has asked us to do in order to honor him? I want to give you a, a fourth thought. Going wherever God leads uh, requires instant obedience and obeying without knowing involves sacrificing now, but fourth, it has hope in what is to come. It has hope in what is to come. Look if you would at verse 10. 
It says four, and it four is important. Four, this is why Abraham did what he did. He lived as an alien. He journeyed. He, he didn't build a city for. He was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. That's interesting that uh, in the New American Standard Bible, they, they leave out one word. And go back again at verse 10, if you would. It says, for he was looking for the city which has, and it should say, the foundations. It's a particular city. Uh, it's a particular place. And, and he amplifies what he means by this through the last line. When he says, whose architect and builder is God. And, and so we understand that there is this, th this place uh, that God has designed. He's the architect, but also he's the builder. Uh, he's the one who's put it together. And, and right away as I, as I thought of that term, I thought of John chapter 14, uh, where Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And, and so you think about it uh, in very simple terms. The earthly son of a carpenter is the eternal son of God, preparing a place where you and I will dwell eternally. Isn't that amazing? You think about God fixing a place up just for you. Uh, with your name on it, reserved in heaven. And even now, the hope that we have as God's children is that whenever he chooses to call us home, uh, it will be home and it will be a place set aside for us. Abraham went where God directed because he trusted God and he sojourned on earth because he knew that this was not home. So whatever God wants me to do, that's what I'm going to do because this is not home. And all the temporal things we go through here should remind us of the fact that we have an eternal home waiting, prepared and built by God himself. So in November, uh, my daughter grandson moved to Georgia. And about 10 years ago, we had the privilege of being able to buy a house inexpensively that they were able to, to live in. And uh, now that house is 90 years old. And it needs to be fixed up in order that we can sell it. So we had a, a dear friend, a couple of dear friends, but one in particular who uh, was just working on the house and, and, and you kind of, there are things that need repair. And, and, and as he pulled some things apart, and he said, it's like Pandora's box. You think about Pandora's box. He said, once you take one thing apart, there's more things. Uh, there's more stuff. And, and it never will get done. Uh, this week we have an inspection on the house and they're going to find all manner of things that aren't right in the house. We know that already. It's a 90-year-old house. Uh, it's a, a square house built in the round world, which means it's just not going to be right in all the ways it's built. But you think about the place built for us by God. Uh, just think about perfection. I mean, that's what it's going to be. Uh, there'll be nothing needs to be repaired. There'll be no dust. Won't it be an amazing thing? No dirt. Uh, it's this place that God has set aside and is building and preparing and adding on to even now as we walk by faith and not by sight. Well, to think about, as I thought about the heroes uh, of faith in Hebrews 11, it, it just really struck me this week, and I, I hope you understand the analogy. Uh, a seaman, someone once told me about baseball. I think about a baseball game, picture in your mind. He said, in a three hour baseball game, there's about three minutes of excitement. Oh, think about that. In a three hour baseball game, there's about three minutes of excitement. It's exaggerating, but really, if you go to a baseball game, you spend a lot of time watching, waiting. Uh, there, there's some activity, there, there's a hit, there's, there's a great play, something takes place. But for the most part, uh, most of the game is spent watching and waiting for whatever it is that's going to happen. And as you look at the heroes of faith in this chapter, uh, we're given the highlights of their life. And while most of their life, as with ours, can be summarized in, in the statement you find in the outline. And, and here's what it is. Our walk of faith is one step at a time, one day at a time, one decision at a time, as God gives us grace. Let me give that to you again. Our walk of faith is one step at a time, it's one day at a time, it's one decision at a time, as God gives us grace. There are big decisions. There are those momentous times in life where we can look at life-changing uh, things that we did that changed the course of our life. But for the most part, our life of faith is one step at a time, uh, one day at a time, one decision at a time. As every single day, God calls us out to walk by faith. Uh, I think about uh, moms who raised kids. And in, in our particular church, we have uh, most of our moms don't have to work. Uh, and so they're able to, to spend time with their kids. And every day, it's getting up, getting the kids, taking care of the kids, walking with the kids, doing the thing with the kids. And, and we're not talking great burning bush experiences. We're not talking the party of the Red Sea. We're just talking about getting lunch. And, and in our minds, uh, we can minimize that to think, well, I'm not a very great Christian. 
And yet when you come to the page of the scripture, you understand that the walk of faith is one step at a time. It's one day at a time. It's one decision at a time. As we faithfully do that which God has called us to do. And granted, there are going to be times in there when God's going to ask us to, to sacrifice or to do something extra, to do something more. Those days, those things happen. But in the meantime, it's one step at a time. It's one day at a time. It's one decision at a time as we walk and follow the Lord. I want to invite you, if you would, uh, to turn over to the book of Colossians. Uh, just a couple of books that I left of where we are. Because there are just three things I want us to end with and to think about. And in Colossians chapter 3, that's where we're going to start. Verses that I've referred to often. As with most of his letters, uh, Paul offers what, what's a theological or doctrinal part of his letter first. So for the first two chapters, uh, he's talking about great theology. He's talking about Jesus, who's the image of the invisible God. He's before all things, that, that he reconciled all things to himself. He talks about uh, the, the various things that come into our theology as Christ followers. But now in chapter 3, he has a therefore. Uh, in fact, it says, if then. Uh, so here's the point, if then. And you have, if then. You've been raised up with Christ, and here's the thing. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. And so here's a, the first thought I want us to remember and consider. And it's this. It's to keep seeking the things above. Keep seeking the things above. And, and notice it's not a one-time deal. It's not just one day. It's every day. In fact, it's every moment. And it doesn't mean that, that consciously uh, I have to go into a monastery and think those thoughts all the time. That's not the point. But the point is that, that I constantly remind myself that this is not home. My home is in heaven. Now, understand, God's left us on earth. So you've heard the expression that some people are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. And that's not what the writer is saying. It's not what Paul is saying at all. But he's saying that as we go about our work, we keep seeking, we keep reminding ourselves that God is alive in us. And he wants to take uh, the very days and moments of our lives and use them for glory for him. So here's the second thought to keep in mind. And set your mind on things above. And again, it's verse 2. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on earth. And, and to set means to place, and there's a finality to it. So verse 1, keep seeking. Verse 2, set your mind. Recognize. Um, the world's going to be chaotic. Uh, things may get very dark. Uh, you eventually are going to wear out. Uh, you and I eventually are going to be called before the Lord. We, we know these things in our mind. And so Paul says, you've you got to set that. You've you got to have that finality. you got to understand that, that our habitation, our final home is with the Lord. And so we set our mind in heaven. Once again, we're not so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. But we remind ourselves that no matter what happens in life, that the pandemic gets worse, that the country uh, gets worse, if, if this storm is worse, if these things in our minds are worse, well, they're not worse for God's children because we've set our minds in heaven. We know that this is not our final home. Uh, we know this is part of living on a sinful planet. And so we rest secure in the fact that as God's children, there's this tremendous hope that we have until he calls us home. And that's the third thought I want you to note, is that we fix our eyes on Jesus. Turn back, if you would, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And I have looked at this verse just a couple weeks ago. We talked about it, um, but it's just this verse that we have to keep in our minds. Once again, after chapter 11 and all these witnesses, all these people who testify of trusting the Lord, of having confidence in him, regardless of circumstances or consequences, in chapter 12, uh, the writer says, therefore, and it's, it's therefore, this is what we got to know. Since we have this great cloud of witnesses, and again, there are two images there that, that many think of. One is that we're in a stadium and, and, and they're watching, which doesn't seem to be uh, the, the best picture. The best picture seems to be, it's like being in a courtroom. And it's just witness after witness after witness has come forward to say, I want to tell you my story. I want to tell you what God did for me. I, I want to tell you how he led me. I want to tell you uh, how I trusted in him. And you have that story too, don't you, if you're God's child? Don't you see how God's worked in your life? Don't you see how God has, has directed you and by grace has led you every single day? And again, you may not have momentous moments. Uh, you probably haven't built an ark in your backyard, right? Uh, but, but we've done that which God has called us to do. 
And by grace, that's what we do. And we're following on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. And so he says, uh, we have this great cloud of witness. And then he goes on to say, let us lay aside every encumbrance uh, and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run, and note the words, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And and we say this often, uh, the Christian life is not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's one day, uh, it's one decision, it's one step at a time. That that we, we, by faith, Follow the Lord as He leads us and as He directs us. But then you get to verse 2. Just fixing our eyes on Jesus. Uh, He's the one who began our faith. He's the author. He's the one who will complete our faith. He's the perfecter of our faith. And who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so it's one step at a time, one day at a time, one decision at a time as God gives us grace. And all the while we fix our eyes on Jesus. Uh, life can get a little blurry. Uh, things can get a little cloudy. Uh, we can get knocked off course. Uh, we can feel piled upon. We, we can have all these things that come upon us. But in the, the midst of everything, we fix our eyes on Jesus. Uh, we keep him as the focus of our life. Because we know that this is not our final home. We live in a sinful planet. That we live in a place where even creation groans, waiting for that day when all things will be made new. But until that day, will you commit, will you say to the Lord, Lord, uh, by your grace, I want to take one step at a time. I'm going to take one day at a time. I'm going to take one decision at a time. And, and, and I want to do so because of your grace, which has been given to me. You've probably heard the story, and I, I've shared it before, uh, but it just really hit me of a missionary who was coming home from Africa. This was back in uh, late 1800s, 1900s. A missionary and his wife coming back from Africa. They'd served the Lord for decades, uh, and they were on the same ship as, as Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt uh, had gone on a safari. He had come back, and, and of course with Teddy Roosevelt, things were big, and so there was a band, and there were crowds, and people were cheering, and, and the missionary and his wife, they came home, and there was nobody to greet them. And so the missionary, uh, just said this kind of, you know how it is. Uh, he, he said to God, he said, Lord, you know, we've served you faithfully for all these years, and, and there's nobody here to greet us as we've come here. And the Lord's words to him were, son, you're not home yet. You're not home yet. You think about when you and I stand before the Lord, and obviously I don't think we're really going to care who greets us, right? Because we'll be with Jesus. But when we stand before the Lord, Uh, the words of the Lord will be well done, good and faithful servant. Because by grace, my prayer is, we've taken one step at a time, one day at a time, one decision at a time, as we have faithfully followed the Lord in our walk of faith and not by sight. Let's pray together. Father, we think about life, and so much of life is how we would look at it as mundane, uh, it's just doing the things of life. We, we get up, we eat, we, we may go to work, we may go to school, we may raise our children, we may uh, volunteer. Whatever it is we do, so much of our life is mundane. And yet, when we recognize your hand upon our life, it gives worth then to that which we do. Uh, to live a life that, that lives by faith, that we trust that, that you've given us the gifts we have, have you given us the abilities we have? You put us in the circumstances in which you've placed us. And we're around the people uh, that you've chosen for us to have. And, and so every single day uh, we step out, understand this is the day that you have made. And so we want to rejoice in it. Uh, we want to serve in it. We want to minister in it. We want to be faithful in it as we walk by faith and not by sight. As so a Father, I pray, encourage our hearts. Remind us as your children that there's a worth to our lives And at one step at a time, one day at a time, one decision at a time, I pray that we will keep in mind uh, that we are your representatives. We're your ambassadors. And no matter what happens around us, this is not home. And so we look forward to that day that we are with you. But until then, I pray that we would walk by faith and not by sight in order that you would be exalted. So we thank you, Lord, for what you've done, for what you've given us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me give you a final thought. And while living on earth, be intent on heaven. 
while living on earth be intent on heaven. And again, just let me say one more time, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. That, that's not the point of Paul's uh, reference in Colossians at all. But it does remind us that no matter what happens around us, uh, we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and the fact that we are not home yet. And until then, I pray that we will walk by faith and not by sight. And at one step, one day, one decision at a time, because of the grace of God given to every single one of us. Amen? Amen.